most welcome to start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra. So uh, on behalf of uh, HelpAge India and the family of HelpAge India, I extend a very warm welcome to the distinguished panel and, of course, all the participants who have uh, joined the webinar today. Uh, our discussion essentially has three contexts, as I see it. One is, of course, the immediate one, which is the UN-marked World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, which is a reminder to all of us of the unfortunate and ugly reality of elder abuse that is gaining ground in the society. The second is, of course, the background of the state of elders in our country and the various challenges they go through, which needs a lot more attention, especially given that the population of elders is going to rise from 10 crores to 30 crores by 2050. And the third is the very dominant COVID-19 context that has disrupted everything around us and also disproportionately affected the lives of the elders. So every year, HelpAge comes out with a report on elder abuse. The definition of abuse itself is very heartbreaking, uh, an action by someone within a relationship of trust leading to harm and distress to an older person. As a country, we have cherished the values of caring for elders, but we often hear now, more often now than ever, about a father or a mother getting beaten by the children, parents thrown out of their homes or abandoned, property-related disputes, verbal abuse, sheer neglect, and so on. So the, over the years, we have tried to bring out some of these dimensions through our survey. But overall, 40 to 60 percent of elders always perceive that abuse is happening, and 15 to 25 percent on an average mention about actually suffering the abuse. This is a complex subject, and we try and see it from various perspectives, from the youth, from the caregivers, in multiple settings, and so on. So this year, we put the spotlight in COVID-19, and what you saw was essentially a sentiment that we could glean from the report around what the elders are feeling and, uh, and uh, what they are going through. Um, there are many struggles that they have, and uh, we will discuss some of that in the report. But the broader question is, of course, is you know what is the society we want to build? a uh, place where older people, parents, grandparents, and our own future selves have a healthy, well-cared, and happy life, or a life of isolation, abandonment, or neglect. So uh, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say that you know, our collective vision is, of course, to build an age-friendly and elder-friendly society, and we'll deliberate on that. So I'll just give a one-line one introduction to all our panelists. Dr. Viren Mishra, of course, Director of National Institute of Social Defense, he has been with the uh, you know several departments, uh, worked on several social issues. Uh, Dr. Rashmi Singh is special secretary, come director in Department of Social Welfare. Uh, she has worked with again with various departments, industries, urban governance, women, child development. She's a strong believer in convergence of actions. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, um, uh, Aloka, who's uh, the head of uh, HSBC, uh, you know, uh, corporate sustainability. Uh, she is she's also part of the committee, uh, the leadership committee there. And uh, we uh, and uh, she's worked on several issues and part of several committees. Uh, Re Rema Mohan is the CEO of the NSC Foundation. She undertake, undertakes CSR on behalf of National Stock Exchange of India and the group itself. Long years of experience in education and corporate social responsibility, worked on district transformation programs and along with the government. Uh, Mr. J.R. Gupta, who has just joined, uh, he's the chairperson of Confederation of Senior Citizen Association of Delhi, uh, which has 142 senior citizen associations associated with more than 10 lakh members. Uh, the council works with the government and essentially for the uh, welfare of elders in terms of their respect, autonomy, and dignity. Uh, Dr. P.T. Shivakumar is a professor of psychiatry at Nimans. He's a leading expert on geriatric psychiatry and has been at the forefront of many initiatives for elderly mental health, dementia care, mental health, uh, in working with the government and stakeholders. So welcome uh, our distinguished panelists and the participants. Uh, Imtia is now, can we request Dr. Singh uh, to, to give her perspective on the topic? Uh, I, will, I will request uh, Dr. Rashmi Singh. And as, doc, as Mr. Rohit Prasad said, she is an IS officer who has worked extensively for pro-poor governance reforms and women empowerment issues, which is core to her heart. Okay. She has done many uh, phenomenal mm -hmm. work in Delhi and elsewhere in looking okay. at you know, the issues of the elderly. I request now Dr. Rasmi Singh to deliberate and speak on 
role of the government in addressing the issue of elderly in COVID-19 inside from NCT of Delhi. Thanks Ashmi. a lot, uh, um, uh, India G and uh, Rohit uh, G, uh, you know, for Health Page India for having invited me for this and uh, uh, Virin Mishra Ji to, you know, enable me to talk first, go first and, uh, you know, I would uh, first of all like to, you know, compliment the way the film, the short film, you know, underscored this entire discourse which we are about to make. Because, uh, you know, no matter what we speak about, you know, this is an issue which, you know, unless and until we realize the critical significance of it, you know, from the lens which you have shown so aptly in the film, you know, when you describe, you know, not just, um, you know, destitution and poverty, but you are describing with the very eyes, you know, the, the sense of isolation, you know, the sense of agreement. So the way it's come across, you know, from the film, I think, you know, you, the, it's really much more than what any one of us can, you know, talk about. Because it was right from the eyes of the people. And I must say that this is an area which often gets overlooked. You know, the feeling that gets overlooked, you know, because maybe because it's not very tangible. So from the government's perspective, you know, normally, wow. if you look at the schemes, they are tailored around social security, financial assistance program, you know, say you have something called the old age pension, you know, and that too, like, yeah, normally it is linked with income status, you know, for people who are in a, you know, disadvantaged position, you know, belonging to lower income groups. But when you look at films like these, you also realize that there are issues, not just those, you know, without, uh, you know, affordable incomes, but it's an issue, you know, which actually requires a more holistic approach where things which are not so tangible, you know, also need to be looked at. You know, for example, the mental health, the emotional health, you know, and that is an area where I'm glad that Nimans is represented here today. And that is an area which today government also, you know, be it the Ministry of Social Justice or the Department of Social Welfare in Delhi or other state governments. Now, increasingly, we are becoming conscious of our role to look at those intangible things also. Because again, intangible things like, you know, besides the financial assistance programs, we do have schemes like running off shelter homes, you know, the old age homes. I was with, uh, say, you know, NDMC, the New Delhi Municipal Council as a secretary there, where we were running old age homes, even on a pay and stay basis. You would have heard of like, yeah, you know, a place called Sandhya and Netaji Nagar. So it's on a pay and stay model. So there's a need today actually to look at the needs, you know, from the point of view of, you know, different strata, you know, belonging to different economic groups, because there are people who don't mind paying for good facility, provided they have a like, yeah, you know, good, you know, caring environment around them. So that caring milieu is something which today I feel that when we look at the topic like this, you know, especially at times of COVID, you know, when you're talking about the kind of emotional stress which senior citizens have been going through, so all the more reason that as a response, you know, we become more and more aware about what this caring environment will really entail. Why I say it is because, you know, normally, again, coming back to the government, you know, schemes and programs, you know, we do have programs to look at healthcare. You know, we do have programs to look at recreation needs, you know, say senior citizen recreation centers. In Delhi also, there are around 100 of them you know, in partnership with NGOs. But, you know, in terms of the quality of service, J.R. Gupta ji, I'm happy to see he's there. And, you know, they're all associated with running of these, you know, in, and with a lot of volunteer contribution. In it. Because, you know, these are senior citizen associations, you know, which come forward and give their own time. So it's time again to look at things where government is like a facilitator, you know, in a facilitating role, but we take things to critical mass. And when I say critical mass, you know, the need is growing because as somebody said, that in terms of the age profile with like, yeah, you know, the need keeps growing and we need to actually look at, you know, the kind of numbers which are needed. Maybe in all the RWAs gradually, in all the RWAs, you'll probably need a senior section recreation center, you know, where people like, yeah, you know, can meet with each other, 
you know and the kind of yeah the you know the isolation which has clearly been reflected so that needs to be seen but you know it needs to be facilitated with say the help of a counselor with the help of a dietitian you know with the help of a yoga expert you know people are going into more of naturopathy so we actually need to look at integrated services integrated models and i'm happy that yeah you know there are schemes which are providing that you know maybe through ayush we do have these centers but they are all spread out so the need is that yeah you know more of integrated services that you map out the need of elders you know in terms of like yeah you know what their overall well being needs so today it's not just shelter today it's not just a question of food today it's not just a question of recreation today it's a question of well being and that well being in terms of physical well being well being in terms of emotional well being and i'm happy to say that there are programs spread all across what we need to do is make sure that every individual you know is actually linked to such programs in a holistic manner and uh, i will end with just two things that in terms of rights in terms of like yeah you know enforceability of these rights we have maintenance tribunals you know 11 of these in 11 districts where you know right now we are again in a position to like yeah have more non official members you know brought in over here and we do expect that more people know about it so that you know their rights you know given by the maintenance act you know that can be enforced properly in terms of like you know their i mean entitlement to uh the the uh, resources at hand i would say you know they are entitled to resources and everybody needs to talk about it and they you know elders don't have to feel shy about asking for their entitlement so that's again something which we need to you know kind of embolden them you know rather than feeling that it is you know something which they are at the mercy of you know their children uh, to be talking about that entitlement and number 2 uh, what i wanted to just like yeah, kind of end with is that uh, you know in association with helpage we have this helpline running in delhi now and it is uh, you know through the ministry of social justice and nist's you know support that yeah you know we have like good technical partners on board but the main challenge here is there are callers there are people to respond to the calls but at the back end we need to have services respond in real time basis so at the back end there needs to be a proper alignment you know be it with the police be it with the health be it with the legal service authority be it with the revenue administration you know be it with our own social welfare and wcb schemes where elder women you know they are also entitled to certain benefits so you know we do have chains of like yeah say you know our field functionaries you know at uh, the grassroots like anganwadis so today we are trying to bring more awareness to this and you know i'm happy to share that uh, through the uh, urban local bodies now we are having announcement made in the various residential colonies i wonder how many of you have seen it but this number you know 14567 you know we recorded a special message that anybody you know sees a senior citizen in distress you know please call this number and it's actually going to market you know it's uh, because the garbage vehicles they travel all over so we had this recording done in the voice of shamin arang and uh, it's come up well so i would really encourage everybody to actually see it and i'll just share it with maybe mtas ji just now so that any time during this like yeah you know uh, if it could also be played so with this like yeah i feel that uh, all of us taking collective ownership government together with the civil society organizations you know and the association of the elders you know and within the government the various government you know verticals and the i would say horizontal layers involved you know that is must 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 and that is the kind of convergence which i keep talking about and thank you for you know uh, uh, giving me the time to you know underscore these things right at the outset thank you thank you very much ma'am i think um, what has been very critical in your deliberation is that you uh, recognize that there are intangible things apart from income and other thing which is isolation and the need for a caring environment to be there and uh, you talked about the innovations that rwa society in fact the urban local body the announcement has been very innovative steps on my end integrated model for sure because we realize we are in a time which is unprecedented and uh, you know everybody should come together to address this risk that the elderly are facing and responding real time as you said is the need of the hour thank you madam for your uh, you know deliberations and your insights 
and experience sharing with us. We are very much thankful for you to be coming here today and attending the uh, webinar. Uh, now I have the pleasure of in, uh, requesting our chief guest, Dr. Virendra Mishra, Director, National Institute of Social Defense, Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, to formally unveil and release the World Elderly Abuse Awareness Day report, The Silent Tormentor, COVID-19 and the Elderly. Um, sir, would it be possible for you to share your screen of the report? This is a tricky one in the virtual format to release. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll have Vishnu uh, share. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Vishnu can yeah. Uh, Vishnu You can, can, you can have uh, Vishnu share. Vishnu. Yeah. yeah, so Vishnu, if you can go full screen. So this is a report. So you want to say something on the release? Yeah, it's a... Um, it's a wonderful report and um, it talks about the situation which is there and like, you know, how vulnerable the senior citizens are and, uh, you know, uh, it has come out very clearly about two things, which I think is, um, you know, it has increased one, the uh, abuse against the senior citizens and the type of abuse has been very clearly like, you know, earmarked, like disrespect, 46.6%, verbal abuse, 26.8%, beating, slapping, 23.8%. And the most unfortunate part which comes out of this report is that, um, like, you know, the family members are involved in, uh, you know, this abuse. Son, uh, like, you know, uh, like it is 43.8% uh, of the kids, you know, their son abusing them. Daughter-in-laws 27.8%, son-in-law 17.8%, and daughters 14.2%, which is very surprising because, like you know, what we of late we have been talking is that like you know it's better to have daughter than a son because daughters are more careful, more sensitive. So the, here we show that more than 14% of the abuse is from the daughters. So this is this is going to be a very important uh, report and. Um, you know, needs to be analyzed further. And when we plan our action plan, so we have to take it into cognizance. So thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll be keen to hear your view in a short while now on uh, your opening address. Uh, yeah, so now uh, we will play a very short video, which we have prepared on the salient findings from the study. Uh, Vishnu, if you can uh, play the video. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, now I will be sharing the uh, salient findings and the major insight from the report. And uh, try to, um, Vishnu, if you can enable sharing. Yeah. So is the screen visible to everyone? Yeah, and as we can see it. Okay. You can quickly go through the report, yeah. yeah. 
yeah so basically this was a survey we did it in six cities uh, our research partner was ipsos research private limited uh, so basically these are the uh, you know section of the uh, study uh, the study was done in two phases one was in the informal setting that is households elderly living in the household so basically we looked at what is the consequences of the pandemic on the family and on the older person the changes in behavior of the young adult caregiver behavior of the family post pandemic and the challenges faced by the caregivers this were in the informal settings at the household level we also uh, try to look at uh, elderly living in old age home basically destitute old age home again on consequences of covid 19 on their life uh, post pandemic how do they see themselves and the challenges faced by the management of old age home during the pand pandemic and later in managing the homes uh, so basically this is a six city report as i said are uh, done in six major city of mumbai delhi kolkata chennai hyderabad and bangalore uh, the findings in the household setting uh, can be summarized as a, uh, so basically uh, majority of uh, the uh, elderly lived with their family and the uh, caregivers who uh, gave, gave care to the elderly 98% were all family members and 27% were sons and 21% were spouse Uh, so that is how the breakup is in terms of the family and the caregiver. Uh, in terms of uh, the challenges that they face when they are living alone during COVID-19 pandemic, the many elderly who lived alone, uh, a overwhelming percentage, that is 43%, said they faced uh, challenges in cooking. There were problem in managing groceries, paying bills, because all of this were had gone into the digital realm, the digital real world, and elderly were being very much challenged because smartphone and computer were something that they are not very comfortable with, and they actually suffered uh, as such in the pandemic. Uh, to the question that uh, you know, inter, are they worried about getting infected by COVID uh, uh, through family members? Fifty-five percent of elderly nationally said yes. Uh, uh, you know, forty-five percent said yes. They are worried, and uh, and that's the breakup of the city that you see. So they are basically very, uh, you know, fearful of uh, contracting the disease. Twenty-one uh, percent of elderly said they had lost a family member or friend during COVID nineteen, and some of the reason uh, of what could have been done better to save their life. Uh, you know, these are the reason. availability of vaccine in injection on time a better health infrastructure so those were the responses that came from people who had lost somebody who was close by uh, who was related or, or or a friend to them uh, health condition of elderly during the pandemic we saw uh, majorly what emerged was joint aches and pains and difficulty in walking so locomotion locomotory ability and ability to move about was very much challenged for them and just imagine just suppose that with the pandemic it was a very tough condition for them uh, you know going through the pandemic and the lockdown 52% as as it is given uh, were with joint aches and pains and 45% had difficulty in walking in terms of uh, whether income have, was impacted during covid 19 i think uh, 52% uh, said their income was impacted and this is a very large percentage and if we look at a breakup and kind of drill down uh, 49% actually lost their job 42% had pay cut uh, those who were in business 30% uh, 34% lost their business and 5% lost their earning family members so that was the reason Uh, yeah again you know loss of job was predominantly the reason uh, on what constitutes elderly abuse 43% elderly said that it is a, a prevalent in the society and disrespect beating slapping verbal abusing is very much there it's a reality uh, and it constitutes elder abuse uh, in terms of experience of elder abuse 16% of the elderly in the household said they have been a victim of elder abuse as dr mishra said um, a son was the main culprit 44% followed by daughter in law and daughter is surprising that from our previous report daughters the number of percentage has actually increased and 62% of the elderly felt that covid 19 increased the risk of them getting abused so basically experience of elder abuse if we see 29% of elderly said that they felt a change in the behavior of the caretaker or family member because of the pandemic and during the pandemic uh, that is a kind of uh, you know uh, uh, you know behavior that they are facing uh, 
Coming to the vaccination, 39% of elderly have not been administered even a single dose of the vaccine. Many reasons, non-availability being the highest, uh, and then uh, traveling was an issue, uh, scared to go to the vaccination centers, so various issues. But I think the situations are improving as we are going on. Uh, I think what, what, what came out very starkly in the report was that 47% of the elderly, they said they feel that the future you know, seems to be bleak for them. They don't find anything positive coming up uh, coming up in the future time, and they don't really actually are enthused about the future. And when asked what was worrisome being infected, they say hospitalization, quarantine, shortage of oxygen, you know, all the reason that we are aware. Uh, so this concludes the elderly, the caregiver in the household setting, 41% of the caregivers said they have not been administered COVID vaccination till now. And whether the impact, 68% of the caregiver were earning members, the salary was impacted in case of 58% uh, of the caregiver and 52% said they are uh, uh, facing difficulty in managing expenses. Uh, so currently what are the caregivers doing? Basically 39% of them are working, 30% working or studying from home. Uh, so lost the job during the pandemic was 22%. And 72% of the caregivers said walking or studying from home doesn't cause inconvenience. This is in stark con contrast to elderly. 68% of them who felt that walking or studying from home actually affected. So there is a disconnect between the younger generation and elderly in knowing their need. Uh, elderly living in old age home again, uh, where they're comfortable and happy, they said yes. Uh, access to regular medication, again, yes. Uh, difficulty, 41% face difficulty. 34% elderly have been vaccinated and they are very much afraid of the COVID-19, you know, contracting the disease. 62% again, hospitalization, quarantine. So similar kind of picture as was emerging at the household level. So these are the feeling of the elderly and these are very subjective feeling where they are waiting for people to call them. Uh, some of the, most of the time they find themselves resting. They want to be uh, want to be with some someone. They want somebody to visit. Uh, Eleven percent had a sleeping problem. They felt less motivated to do things. Anxiety was a common feature, and worriness about themselves and uh, others was something that came up. Uh, what constitutes elderly abuse? Sixty-six percent elderly felt that uh, in COVID-19 pandemic, the risk of them getting abuse has increased. So this is a very uh, you know which is saying that they are basically feeling that the risk has gone up. 36% elderly agreed that the elderly abuse is prevalent. 27% of the elderly actually come from in an old age home that they have actually faced abuse. And that is quite a concerning thing because these are institutional settings. Um, experience of elder abuse, 34% elderly felt that the change of the behavior is there since the COVID-19 pandemic started. Um, whether you feel depressed looking at the situation, I think, uh, ranging from a little to most of the time, all of the time, nearly, uh, you know, 90% of them actually felt that feeling. Uh, your communication with the others, your loved ones, 59% uh, of them said that the communication has got affected because of COVID. Uh, caregiver in the old age home, 60% said that they had difficulty in access. Uh, they faced difficulty in regular groceries, medicine. Uh, they didn't get any help uh, and support for their, uh, you know, their old age home. And uh, funds and resources were quite constrained, 15-50% uh, of the cases. And they basically contacted whatever resources locally or NGOs they could find to uh, basically go by. Basically, what the survey is showing is that COVID has been a very significant disruptor. Uh, however, elderly remain optimistic post-COVID, but they, in 43 percent of elderly, they have reported abuse. They said their schedules have been impacted negatively, and significant number of caregivers reported a reduction in wage, which is actually leading to stress and uh, anxiety at their end, and their ability to care for elder people is expected to see a drop. It's already dropping. There was difficulty in accessing healthcare for elderly people. Uh, fear of increase in abuse has also increased during the pandemic and basic items were uh, not available. So all in all, elderly have become very uh, much, uh, you know, lonely, very uh, much marginalized and mental issue is something which is coming on very starkly because of the neglect, either at the family level, society or at the community level. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need to do something to ensure that they have a better life. Thank you very much.
now I'll request uh, Dr. Venendra Mishra to give his opening address on the of, uh, you know, uh, role of the government and the COVID-19, the response of NISD and Ministry of Social Justice. Mm -hmm. Dr. Virendra Mishra, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And that was a very eye-opening report and, um, you know, the information which was shared. So it tells that what is the situation right now. So it's not very encouraging, but certainly if we come together so we can create wonders. So, you know, uh, interestingly today, India is a, a nation called as a country of youth or a young country. And the simple reason is that the average population of India is soon going to be 29 years or it's already 29 years. And um, I don't know if you know that the, according to the National Youth Policy 2014, any person falling within the age bracket of 15 to 29 years is um, you know, considered to be a youth. So just imagine if uh, this country with a population of more than 130 crore people. So if their average age is 29, so certainly it's a young population, India. But, you know, it does not wash out the reality that uh, India is aging as well at the same time. In 2011, the 8.6% population is of elderly citizens. And that, you know, uh, when we say 8.6%, it becomes 103 million. So, and by 2050, we at a growth of 3%, annual growth of 3%. So it is going to swell to 319 million. So just imagine what population we are expecting of senior citizens in just like, you know, 30 years down the line. So, and all these uh, youngsters, they are also going to age. And at the same time, they are going to be at a situation where they're going to be at the decision-making level. So now like, you know, we have to, the most pertinent question which comes is, is that is government or the civil society organization and community at large prepared to address these problems of elderliness? Mm. Now it has been highlighted, like, you know, what are the problems? So are we prepared for that? That is what we have to just like, you know, revisit and uh, introspect. COVID-19 has exposed the vulnerability of the elderly, and it has bade our preparedness. We have seen that, what mm. has happened. The second wave has clearly depicted that you know, the virus is not just as in the first wave, it was told it is going to hurt more the senior citizens. The second wave has shown that everyone is vulnerable, but still it has been found that the severity and fatality of this virus is higher among the elderly. And scientifically, the reason is very simple because the senior citizens have multiple comorbidities, including diabetes, be it hypertension, the kidney issues, or not really pulmonary issues. You know, there are so many other comorbidities that they are carrying in their body and the immunity certainly gets like you know compromised because of these comorbidities so they are more vulnerable but is only these physical health issues the um, uh, the vulnerability that we are talking about no the vulnerability extends to psycho social economic and environmental issues as well so you know the preventive mantra of covid 19 has been social distancing which I've always like, you know, have been um, saying that it shouldn't be social distancing because it is going to kill the people. It should be physical distancing. Social distancing would be, mean that you even distance yourself socially from them. And so even the physical distancing, if you talk about, so, you know, uh, which is important, you know, COVID appropriate behavior has um, like, you know, though it has prevented the elderly from getting infected, but it has taken its toll on their physical and psychosocial well-being. It has negatively impacted their holistic health, and um, and uh, you know there have been cases where it, it has uh, been very clearly said, as uh, even the report said, that you know it has impacted their financial status, mental health, and aggravated their vulnerability to a great extent. So all these aggravation are you know has increased the risk of elderly abuse of elders. So that is one of the reasons where everybody has like you know now understands it. They acknowledge it that elderly abuse is a reality. And that is one of the reasons why, like, you know, uh, today uh, we are observing a world elder abuse of NSD, not just by UN, but by each country and other communities have come forward to discuss the, you know, how should we try to address this problem. The report, uh, you know, has been very well uh, laid down by HelpAge India, so we don't need to discuss about it any further. But it shows that, like, you know, the abusers are not from outside. The abusers are there in the house. The, their vulnerability 
you know has to be addressed but it cannot be addressed just by um, like you know um, uh, by lip service there has to be some action to be taken so let me give you a brief look what government of india is doing what nisd is doing so uh, very recently as alpej india has been like you know our partner in many places in uh, you know starting the elder line which is the um, um senior citizen helpline so with the number 14567 which even rashmi man talked about so that is one thing which is um, going to help them and as it is being advertised more and more um does as the state governments uh, come on board more aggressively so certainly it is going to help the senior citizens um to you know to get their problems addressed so the main idea of the elder line um like you know uh, is to provide information guidance emotional support to senior citizens as well as the field intervention so like you know at eight states in eight states it has already been launched and um, already we are like you know at the last stage uh, with the other um, states so in 35 states certainly it's going to start very soon so besides this another important initiative which has been taken up by the uh, ministry and um, uh, nisd is that seven empowered expert committees have been constituted and you know to plan the programs for well being of senior citizens so you know these seven are like you know creating one is creating elderly self help groups in up semi urban as well as rural areas which is known by as agrasar group which means action groups aimed at social reconstruction second group is like you know suggesting and uh, coming up with the capacity building and research needs uh, related to senior citizens then is the media and advocacy advocacy which is very very important because like you know a lot of information is not there with the people and uh, even the senior citizen doesn't know much about what is available to them then comes like you know uh, the csr funds how do we mobilize them and channelize them for elderly unfortunately the csr has never uh, has not been focusing much on senior citizen uh, in the senior citizen area so this has been taken up that how do we channelize that csr and mobilize the Or like you know, uh, institutions um, which which want to fund. Then, um, as Ma'am was saying, Lishmi Ma'am was saying that you know required is integrative approach and um, ensure for their entitlements. You know they should not totally bank on their family members. So other you know three um, committees which are working on are like you know portion of yarn for elderly. You know to ensure that they could get good meals, and um, one portal is for like you know skilling of elderly, basically meant to provide a sort of like you know employment exchange for senior citizens, and also a very important program called Sage, where uh, you know we are inviting the startups who want to work in the area of elderly care, and there would be equity participation, and up to the level of one crore rupees, the government is going to you know help them. Uh, with so uh, there's going to be an equity share. So these are the you know new initiatives which have been taken up um, by government of India, which is going to create a very very good uh, you know conducive ecology for um, for the development of um, senior citizens. Now besides this, like you know we are looking on the um, alternate uh, alternative mental health issues. what can, how can we do that besides the medicines that has been more prescribed so you know with india yoga association we had uh, a mou and uh, planning to start uh, trainings in for the all the yoga therapists in the old age home uh, old age homes and uh, 75 new senior citizen homes which are going to start in coming like you know one year that is again a huge number because already we have more than 500 Uh, 600 plus, so it's going to like you know uh, increase. Uh, it would broad, broad base, and as uh, the report was saying, um, the L page report that people are very comfortable in um, senior citizen homes, so they were taken care of. So this is going to help them. And then because like you know there is a dearth of um, geriatric care bedside assistants or caregivers, so NISD conducts three months certificate, and we are broad basing it, increasing. inviting more proposals so that more and more people um, um get you know trained as caregivers also we are having a one year pg diploma course um, which is for integrated geriatric care besides like you know we work with all lot many stakeholders uh, who are available um, you know so that we can encourage them to promote intergenerational bonding so this is one thing is very very important the gap which has come 
which has um, you know has some of the shahs which has developed between the senior citizens and the generation next generations you know down the line so uh, somehow this intergenerational bonding needs to be promoted so that they start understanding the value that these people carry value means like you know the uh, enriching value the what they can share which is going to help this generation over a period of time so um, these are the like you know the broadly the programs which are being run by the government and um, there are many more but it will go on and on and on if i just speak you know one by one but broadly these are the new initiatives that we are talking about and i hope that um, in coming days the um, situation of the senior citizens is going to improve but we do need that all the stakeholders come together join hands and um, work for the welfare of the senior citizens thank you so much thank you sir uh, i think you have very rightly pointed out that uh, pandemic uh, the second wave especially caught all of us off guard you know we were not prepared for the kind of deadly uh, you know uh, virus and the uh, and the and the aftermath of it um, but i think i also agree with you the fact that uh, you know in the in the process elderly psychosocial mental and other issues have been hampered and uh, and and i you know as 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 helpage you would like to put on record the uh, an napsrc the national action plan for senior citizen that the ministry has put it is very apt uh, it actually covers all that you've mentioned in terms of the helpline being functional the old age home being supported uh, to the point that caregivers being trained are, is also going to get supported you know for for bed bound immobile elderly so it's uh, the uh, we've made a good beginning in terms of the national action plan the elder line has got uh, you know activated and have uh, action uh, we hope to see others also getting action and in that we, have, we, we we will be a very strong ally with you and look forward to taking it forward thank you sir very much sir for your deliberations um now i have the pleasure of introducing dr uh, dr pt sif kumar professor of psychiatry nimhans uh, so basically uh, dr uh, pt sif kumar uh, works at nimhans and has done many pioneering work not within the hospital setting but in the community in terms of improving the mental health with a special focus on elderly so dr sif kumar i think today's uh, entire webinar or today's session is custom made for you because the way you know mental health issues have really you know surged and come come forth and uh, you know how the elderly are being impacted from a physical level in the first wave when, when there was access issue we have come to the second wave where we have uh, it percolated to a very uh, mental and psychosocial level but the elderly have started feeling the pinch of it of saying you know they are you know going and insomnia is there you know they're feeling restless somebody to talk to them i think these are very deep rooted um, you know malaise whose miasms are very well known um, so i think as a society we would need to see what we do to be able to address this because covid is not going anywhere it's come to stay we'll have to find out what we need to do and you are the best person uh, currently with us who could tell us what is it that we need to do the nimhans i uh, you know effort and initiatives and the helpline that you run is a uh, you know yes. very you know very nice helpline that you have uh, so dr shiv kumar mm -hmm. uh, over to you uh, please share your experience and suggestions on what need to be done thank you uh, thank you very much uh, yes and um, uh, at the outset i would like to uh, thank uh, helpage for uh, inviting me and giving this opportunity and uh, good morning to all the panelists and i think uh, the help page every year comes out uh, with a report of elder abuse i think that it adds to the advocacy of uh, how much uh, we can actually systematically study and communicate that this is something like uh, which is a persistent problem and i would still say it is an underestimation mm. uh, because uh, in our uh, systems people hesitate to actually share what uh, they experience uh, stigma is still a main uh, issue and uh, uh, as you see many of the uh, offences uh, is happening through family members so it is not easy for people to acknowledge it and people silently kind of hold it and then don't tell us and i think uh, uh, the underestimation is something which we need to keep in mind and uh, as everybody spoke i think mental health is getting more attention uh, and the impact of covid is actually amplifying it even before covid i think the realization is increasing i think over a period of time now the last few years we see celebrities talking about mental health 
and uh, the National Mental Health Survey, which actually gave a systematic data in terms of uh, for the first time in the country to have numbers, almost 10% having diagnosable mental health problems in the country. And uh, along with that, the extent of substance abuse and other things. So when it comes to elderly, I think another important data what we have even pre-COVID is the LASI data, Longitudinal Aging Study of India, which again has given a, a very important data for us to uh, understand uh, that large proportion of people are having mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, and cognitive problems. And uh, nearly uh, significant proportion, like almost one uh, fourth, 25% actually requires assistance for basic daily activities. And if you look at uh, at least one uh, independent activities of daily living, almost 50% requires assistance for independent activities of daily living. So this is something which is pre-COVID 2017-18 data. And uh, the support systems, what we have, how much ever we have for the economic limitations of our country. And still, I think we should, we should acknowledge that this is something like uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, kind of uh, insufficient. We have to go a long way. I would just give an example. Uh, maybe uh, there is a recent report on uh, Royal Australian Commission on Aged Care. They spend, the government spend almost $21 billion uh, for uh, Australian dollars for carrying uh, almost 13 lakh individual senior citizens who are availing their aged care. And they have come out with so, so much of extensive reports that it is still not satisfactory. There's so many issues and issues of abuse. And uh, what is what we are talking about is a compassionate care. So the mental health element is something which is the most underlying thing. We can actually assist physical activities. We can do mechanically, but the person has to perceive it as a uh, in a compassionate way the care is delivered, both by family members or by professional caregivers. I think that is the important task. Coming to the COVID, I think we all uh, pay attention to the acute issues. As a mental health professional, I am more concerned about the long-term effects. Actually, acute, many times the helplines will help. We all, uh, most of it is a disaster response. What we see is uh, a, a, a normal reaction to an abnormal event. So this is something like uh, many of us would have experienced this, including professionals or young people. It is a universal experience. A lot of uncertainty is there. So we do undergo problems like sleep disturbances, anxiety, some worries as to what is going to happen. Am I going to uh, kind of manage this crisis? So it's a universal experience. And sometimes there are some reports actually say elderly are more resilient than younger people. We need to, uh, there are systematic studies which have documented that. And uh, it is not always a homogeneous response that elderly are doing bad. So in, in fact, if you look at around families, many times they're actually uh, kind of helping the younger people facing the stress. So uh, there are examples of that, actually. Uh, I think this is something I am getting because I am also interacting with a lot of volunteers. And I can see the eagerness with which they participate. And then actually, they, when, they, when we started a lot of outreach initiatives, they wanted us to focus on positives. They don't want to listen about illness. They don't want to listen about all the numbers, statistics. They want to come out of it by looking at positives. So that is something learning, which I also uh, I agree. It's very important. So looking at the long-term effects, I think poverty, uh, the kind of effect it has had, uh, people losing their relatives, all these things, the kind of trauma which they have undergone, uh, people who have gone through uh, medical issues like with COVID, who have developed hypoxia, all these things are going to actually increase the number of people with cognitive impairment, number of people with mental health issues. So we need to prepare our support systems uh, based on those those expectations and then try to strengthen our systems so uh, coming to what we have been doing i think uh, we as a government organization we have a mandate to provide mental health support and uh, nimans started a psychosocial helpline from the beginning of the first wave itself which, which also included as a separate kind of a, a link for elderly and we have been getting calls um, uh, i think there are many other helplines also running and many volunteers uh, have uh, uh, helped with this initiative. I think this is doing a good job in terms of at least managing the acute crisis. What we have uh, uh, actually done is also we have launched an initiative called Vayo Manasa Sanjivani, which is an outreach initiative, which uh, Dr. Virendra Mishra was there and the Secretary of uh, Senior Citizens the, uh, the Social Justice and uh, Empowerment Department had actually launched it last October. And through this initiative, 
we have started uh, weekly awareness programs but more importantly we actually decentralized it in bangalore we have uh, we have had eight groups of senior citizens which have actually around 20 to 30 people in each of the group and then they discuss and they actually lead this initiative now and slowly we are trying to extend it to tamil and also hindi we have actually started a group now so we are trying to expand this uh, as uh, slowly so because we want these things to be decentralized and it should be senior citizen led initiative rather than expert led initiative and training of volunteers is another important thing what we have done and these people who are coordinating these programs are volunteers many of them are senior citizens almost all of them and they are very active and they are meticulously doing this thing and they have actually got trained to use online forums like zoom and they are using it now uh, another important initiative based on suggestion from senior citizens is we have started this activity forum i know many other ngos are also doing this now i think this is something which we have a good positive experience where it is not just about awareness it is about interaction and a meaningful activity i think this is something we called as sandhya karanji in kannada and this uh, activity program we have been doing it for last 2 3 weeks now and this has got a good response and from the professional side we are doing the tele mental health services and nimans actually had developed a uh, uh, electronic record uh, system uh, based on the funds what we got through the award we got a few years back we got the award for biostress samman award that money helped us to kind of develop an electronic record system and uh, that came in a big uh, kind of uh, support for us to actually provide tele consultations without relying on the physical records even when the opd services were very much disrupted in the first wave so uh, i think that we have been able to ensure continuity of care as much as possible with the help page we have been running the uh, psychosocial support in old age homes the experience what we had there was many of the people actually were concerned about basic necessities i think the, the old age as your report also brought it uh, brought out that they are actually uh, working with lot of constraints in terms of human resources in terms of finance I, i think their uh, challenges are not just because of covid covid has only amplified it and the number of trained human resources what they have is very minimal i think we need to extend the support to standardize i think what we need is some kind of a regulation and some kind of accreditation and some kind of more support actually to strengthen the services in the old age homes i think they are doing a good job as our director to, uh, told but i think we have still a long way to go in terms of uh, many of these people who may not be uh actually savvy to conduct this in a very professional manner and uh, uh, we are uh, just in the process of uh, we have got a major funding from national stock exchange foundation rema mohan madam is there i think some of our activities are hampered by the covid second wave but we have got all of our staff recruited the mission is to train caregivers uh, and then do it as a skill development and do it as a job placement for them i think this has a huge potential as a job employment strategy the demand is very high and if you look at the global uh, scenario the majority of the care support is provided at home we also have to develop that a uh, community based and home based support system through caregivers because we can't have institutional support as a main form of uh, care so when we do that we have to train the caregivers in a systematic manner and majority of them require training in mental health and dementia if you look at the global scenario when you have a uh, good uh, systems uh, the people who require more support for uh, is people who have dementia and people who have mental health issues that is where the caregivers find a difficulty and that we are going to kind of formally launch it and then uh, do as a training with the focus in ramnadapuram which is adopted by nsc but it is a national project which we would like to expand it through support from nisd we are in the process of doing that we also are starting a dementia care center with the support of rec foundation rural electrification corporation foundation that uh, it has been sanctioned some 10.4 crores have been sanctioned uh, which is going to come up in the next year and uh, i think uh, these are some of the major things which we are uh, kind of going to have i would like to emphasize that lot of support we can provide by home based uh, system through volunteers and this is something even tele support which we are trying to experiment actually trying to do uh, apart from the helpline i think we need a sustained care i think mental health is not only a crisis intervention as you know some of the people said people want somebody to talk to them somebody to provide support so that kind of initiatives globally are happening i think we need to uh, promote those kind of initiatives 
I think the professional role is actually only for the tip of the iceberg. We need to do a lot of preventive and promotive mental health services, which can happen with the field work and with outreach initiatives. And that is what Nimans is also trying to do. Uh, I would stop here and uh, I think uh, I thank uh, for the opportunity. I think we need to continue this dialogue and continue these initiatives in a much more uh, coordinated and uh, in, a, in future. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your insights and deliberations. Uh, the current pandemic is cataclysmic in proportion and totally unprecedented in a way in which mankind is struggling to grapple with it. It is said that unprecedented situation demand extraordinary responses. In line with this thinking, while we have defined the issues and challenges of the elderly in the pandemic through our research report, we also have through this webinar brought together multi-sectoral stakeholder. This is so as the mammoth challenge of the pandemic will not be solvable by one person, organization or body. It would require concerted effort across sectors, department and disciplines to mount a joint response to the pandemic, which has proved to be the upper hand in the uh, till now, uh, as we see. So basically we have discussed a lot on the initiatives and the intervention that we can do to support the elderly. But I think all of you will agree, um, everything will work when money comes in. So we have, uh, we have uh, our funders and donors from the corporate world. And I'm happy to invite now Ms. Uh, Aloka Majumdar from HSBC, uh, CSR Head uh, for Corporate Sustainability at HSBC India, to share her insights on the COVID-19 pandemic and how HSBC is basically responding to the need of the elderly, not only within the organizations, uh, the elderly of the employee, but also within the community as the pandemic is slowly spreading and uh, getting yeah. larger and larger. Um, um, Aloka, ma'am, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Imtiaz. Um, so, you know, some very, very important points uh, have already been covered by the previous speakers. Uh, so what I'll try and do is, you know, focus on uh, things that we are looking at. Uh, but just just as a very brief background, I think what has come out is that, you know, you, there are some tangible things that needs to be done and there's some intangible things. And the intangible part of it is becoming pretty significant, uh, uh, particularly well-being and mental health, as every the other speakers have spoken about. Uh, the only thing in this particular area is what we've seen, it requires long-term investment because, you know, mental health and well-being cannot be done. You can't say I have a program for six months or a year and then that's done. So that's something that's been our experience in dealing with, dealing with mental health and well-being within the company and which is now, uh, which is now emerging as one of uh, the very, very important uh, aspect in many companies. So it is as important for the elderly and there needs to be long-term intervention in this, uh, in this area because our focus so far has been more tangible, you know, healthcare, of course, a long way to go, but still I'm just saying that this is another thing where we see long-term investment um, going in. Uh, you know, being a financial institution, our focus of course has always been on income generation and our and this is something that we are not going to uh, we are not going to let our guard down because the fact is i think we think financial independence takes care of a lot of other issues that anybody faces and that's how in fact our partnership with help aid started many years back and uh, we are we are very privileged to work with an organization like yours where you have worked very very extensively across states etc to look at uh, livelihoods and we got very new perspectives because I think uh, Mr. Mishra made a very important point. Being a young country, we never talk about the elderly when it comes to any of your programs. So any community investment programs that you have in India today, it's typically focused on young people. And uh, elderly, I think I don't think the word elderly actually features. It's seen as something more charitable. It is not seen as more developmental. But mm -hmm. the fact is, in spite of the country, we do have a very large population who are uh, who are getting old and and because we are a, a country with a large number of people we are going to see only an increase in the number of old people in the coming years so as a result it would be an important thing to look at even from the livelihoods perspective or income generation perspective so this is something which is going to be our focus uh, which will continue to be our focus in the coming years. so that's one thing that i wanted to highlight also, I want to re-emphasize this is becoming even more important post-pandemic. Uh, the only thing is we need to look at that how 
maybe there is some way of you know the future of work is going to be slightly different and that's something that i think we have to deliberate with organization like yours in terms of how we look at the livelihood space in the post pandemic world i think that's something that um, we are going to look at the next is of course um, you know vaccination i think because to dealing dealing with this uh, pandemic i think every other country this is what we are seeing across the globe is that vaccination at this point of time whatever we know about the pandemic vaccination seems to be one uh, way to address it and this is something that we would like to encourage uh, uh, and i know that you know mr mishra spoke about csr money not coming in for elderly i think it's extremely critical to understand that you know as a as a family structure we all stay with our parents or parents in laws so it's as a, it's as important to get them vaccinated and that's something that's going to be a big drive for us we've already partnered with you in this and this is something we really want to expand um, one of our focus is actually scale and uh, uh, you know csr grants however big it may be at the end of the day we have our constraints in terms of uh, in funds and i think lots of investments are required so i think one of the things to look at is actually to get corporates together to uh, make them understand the importance of this and then you know have more collaboration so that we can there can be more scalable programs and we are quickly able to scale the programs that uh, uh, that organization like yours and your partners are working on so that's another thing the third part which is uh, i think um, uh, the previous speaker spoke about is the skilling part we have a very large skilling uh, program and what we have realized is again that this is you know the entire skilling ecosystem is going to go through a major change post pandemic because jobs which or, or sectors which were supposed the number of jobs many of those sectors are now not going to be so active in the next they're going to take time uh, to again come back but some of the sectors and particularly the caregiving sector i think can create a large number of um, jobs uh, in the country uh, it the the challenge is how quickly we put this in place because i think the need is now uh, we see this uh, in every place it's not easy because in the covid situation you always have the fear of going to uh, a family where you have covid affected people etc but how quickly you train and place them is also to be another big challenge but that's something we see huge potential uh, in the coming days uh, but this definitely is going to be a large focus area for us in in going forward uh, the last point i want to make is that you know in in our work in the company we've seen that uh, 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 in terms uh, in plus you asked me about you know what the company is doing i think the comp from a company's perspective because we hire a very large number of people uh, it, the insurance part is a very very important part uh, we talk about it as a financial institution because the coverage is still quite low in the country so i think medical insurance coverage should be a, a, a focus for all of us to see that the elderly are you know were covered through medical insurance and even csr grants can be used for this purpose so that's something that one can look at um and uh, and of course you know dealing with stress anxiety depression bereavement these are going to be now it's going to stay for us stay with us for a while now i mean you know the pandemic is not going away so how we create a, there are a helplines that um, um this thing spoke about in the but i think it scaling it up replicating and taking it to the rest of the country is also going to be one a big focus uh, for us working with an organization like yours would be to look at it in a more comprehensive manner and tailoring it to see that you know whichever are the focus areas which aligns with our priorities we are able to scale it uh, with you and and your partners so i'll stop here imtiaz and hand over to you thank you ma'am thank you very much for your deep insightful thing i totally you know agree and resonate with you on when you say emphasize on the elderly need for a focus there and uh, of course uh, the livelihood space is going to change post pandemic so how do we kind of you know kind of uh, you know adapt ourselves vaccination is an important area what was very much heartening for me to also hear from is because i led this space in helpage india is the skilling part and uh, and uh, skilling has been our one of our recent initiative and we are looking at uh, you know skilling young people as caregivers for elderly and i think there is a lot of chance for us and you know uh, scope for us to be looking at this space because uh, as the pandemic goes on and 
with bereavement, with loss of family member, with family member being not with them, I think that is where this this will play a big role. There are some challenges, but then I think we'll have to just look at it from a perspective of how do we deliver it on the ground. You know, uh, that is something that we'll need to look at. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your deliberations. Uh, I have the pleasure of now inviting uh, Ms. Rema Mohan, uh, Chief Executive Officer, NSE Foundation. Uh, ma'am, uh, we would uh, be very keen to know from you uh, what has been the NSC Foundation's approach vis-a-vis -vis this pandemic and elderly and from a from an employee perspective of course but more so from a rural perspective because NSC's focus has been very rural and now this pandemic is now rapidly spreading and rural becomes a very much concern area for everyone because uh, the health infrastructure is not so great the response is not you know, you know the quality of response that may be required in a pandemic situation in rural area may not be there so we would like to know from you what is nsc foundation's thoughts on those how are they looking at it and what is your suggestion on the road forward given the pandemic is in the country and then you know we would need to respond in a certain manner so uh prima ma'am over to you now Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today and to spend my early, early morning and I mean early afternoon, late morning with all of you, such an esteemed panel. Uh, I know many of you personally, and it's always such a pleasure to have such high quality discussions and thoughts centered around uh, such a critical area such as uh, elder care. We are all not, uh, not in our 20s, so I think all of us also resonate with this topic a lot. Um, I'm going to Imtiaz just uh, share a little screen uh, so that uh, I, I have a small PPT that I've put together. Uh, yeah, NSC sure. is a recent entrant into the CSR space. Not many know of us and the type of work that we do. So I just like a very brief introduction and then I'll just get into some of the, of the things that we do specifically in the elder care, some of our partners. So it will be more of a structured uh, you know, discussion and then um, I, can, I can then share our thoughts on the way forward. Sure, ma'am. Uh, Vishnu, if you can enable uh, Rema ma'am's sharing option. Yeah, rights have been given to ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, you can share. If you don't mind, can you tell me whether the screen is visible? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. You can wonderful. see. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. wonderful. Thank you. So, um, so to start with, NSE is uh, India's premier stock exchange. Uh, we got into CSR as a very recent entrance post the, uh, the Section 135 mandate for CSR in 2014. The journey of NSE as a company has been uh, quite spectacular. We've done a lot of innovative things something which is very unique to our company. We are brand leaders in many of the segments that we represent. And I think these are things that we also take into the CSR space where we look for convergence, collaboration, and innovation within our programs. The NSE Group CSR philosophy, um, if we were to look at CSR, we have two functions within NSE. One is the SEVA and one is the SAVE. So SEVA is what we actually do as CSR. We also have other, uh, other initiative, other activities that we're doing, but we've taken a conscious effort to keep it really separated from the CSR. So we do a whole amount of life, life skills, financial literacy programs, and other things which we as a corporate are mandated to do. But SEVA, where we say, look, we need to put our heart into this, into the CSR and keep it very different from our business activities is where we really um, uh, you know, deploy all the CSR funds and do it in a very structured, uh, structure, structured manner through NSC Foundation. Um, if you see here, we have got more or less, we are there in almost every segment that, uh, uh, that one needs to really be involved in, be represented in, and each one of these segments is important to development. Where we say primary education, can we teach a person functional literacy? At least that person knows to read, that person knows to write, and can 
take on his life, even if he's just done a seventh or eighth standard, even if he's fallen out, not that we want children to fall out of school, but even if they do so, they are able to have functional literacy. Elder care, which is the other spectrum of, the, of this entire age life cycle. So we feel that these are two segments which are within the other segments, extremely critical. And these are the segments that we really need to get interventions in on. Reaching the unreached, most of our programs are not where other CSR, other activities, other organizations are. Um, help Age will be testimony to the fact that in places like Karauli or West Bengal or other places where we are, when they first went in to these states, to these, um, to these um, areas, locations, blocks and villages, there really was not even a, um, a, a situation where they could have an office. They took hunt around for offices, they took hunt around for staff, and there was really no other agency or other organization there. So I think really reaching the unreached and going to places where few have really gone are, are the cornerstone of how we um, approach our CSR activities. Enabling change, we realize that it can only be through collaboration and convergence and more, more people, more agencies who come together means efficiency of resources which are extremely valuable. And CSR, as you know, is, is of course, um, you know, if, if we look at the entire spectrum of fund availability, CSR constitutes very little of that, um, of the fund going into the developmental sector. Though, of course, I would say that if one gets the, um, you know, all the paperwork, documentation, and, and the agencies, the partners are good, it's more or less easier to access rather than the other funds. The elder care programs, we have a large number of partners and uh, extremely unique programs. We recognize, as does HelpAge, that uh, financial inclusion and um, independence in terms of social independence, elders helping each other, elder for elders concept, as well as the health empowerment, so these are fundamentally the areas one really needs to work upon to strengthen rural elderly. So we have a large number of partners who worked uh, for quite some time with us on skilling programs, health related, financial inclusion and other programs. Again, uh, social health and livelihood are the cornerstone of our CSR elder health initiatives and uh, really working on large, uh, you know, on scale across, um, across of almost six states today on all these programs where uh, social inclusion, yes, where the elder for elder concept comes where each one supports the other. And you're right that today loneliness and social issues are, uh, you know, are as important as being financially independent and also being, um, being uh, health enabled. Our response to COVID uh, where we have uh, where we initially we started working with all our all our partners and we knew that the organizations had to be fundamentally strengthened people hadn't started thinking about how are they going to get their funds what if the funds dry up how are they going to re reorganize their strategies how are they going to work towards or uh, if if the lockdown extends for a longer time how are they going to manage their field operations so these were things we did in may because we realized at that time that there could be a possibility that this entire COVID, because it is a virus after all, and 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 we all know that uh, you know it's a huge challenge to uh, you know when the vaccine comes, when people are vaccinated. So it didn't look like an early closure to that whole incident of last year's lockdown. So we started with all our fifty plus partners, and each one of our segments we tried to yeah. strengthen the organizations as well as the. Um, as, as the individual programs. Uh, I'm not going to get into the COVID response because each and every corporate has done so much. So I don't want to, but I've just mentioned it. But what I would want to mention is the COVID prevention in terms of vaccination awareness and facilitation. Now, this is where we find that a large number of these activities would need to be focused to the elders. Again, what we find in the rural areas is that though people are able to access vaccine, of course, there is this huge, uh, huge aspect of um, 
of not wanting to go in for vaccination. There is this hesitancy that comes in. And there are a lot of misinformation saying that, Acha, yes, uh, you know, it's an urban issue. This is not going to come to the rural areas. We are safe. So this sense of false security, there are a whole lot of issues that are there. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to get into that. But what we find is even if we were to overcome that initial um, uh, you know, hesitancy, barriers, belief systems that are there within people, it's again the elders who are at risk because they are not able to go to the vaccine center. So we're working closely with the district administration to see, can we run vans that can take the vaccine to the people rather than the other way around? Or otherwise, if we do need to then run buses and other things, once we get the, you know, you know, you get more um, of, um, um, you know, of a flow into this entire vaccination drive and the traction happens. So we are now just in the planning stage. We are trying to do little models and pilots um, and, and see what, you know, what works, what's required and what is the, um, the uh, is actually required on the field. But I think come next month, we will be ready to roll this out in a very large manner. So these are some of the models that we've done here and there to see what really works and what we need to do. So, uh, so I come to the end of this uh, thing, but I just would want to go back uh, to one of the slides uh, to say that, um, one minute. So what is it that we think we should do as a corporate going forward in this space? Because it is critical at each one. Of, and I entirely agree with you that the CSR as a sector, um, for them, the elder care is something that has been looked on as a charitable activity, uh, more in terms of a philanthropic uh, nature, uh, you know, and not, not something that is more in terms of a development. But we forget that if we are having this huge segment of population and the rapidly aging population. Going forward, we're going to have a stress on the economy. So it's really a catch-22 situation that you, you want to invest in areas that uh, appear more, um, uh, you know, more relevant, like say a primary education or a health, and then say, okay, elders don't need to, you know, don't need that much of um, attention at this moment through CSR or through any other government initiative or anything else. But if we see next 10, 20 years, all of us, I mean, at least on this panel, I'm sure in the next 20 years, for sure, we are going to be senior citizens. So if we are representative, then there's this huge population out there. And we, we have population means the numbers, unfortunately for us in India, uh, we're going to have a huge number of crores of people who are going to be in the segment. and we must remember each one of the segment is extremely, um, uh, extremely structured and each one has its own unique requirements. And that is where the challenge is that there is no homogeneity within this whole thing. It's not a homogeneous segment. Uh, we can't approach it with one size fits all. A rural elderly living near a city will have um, other requirements. Rural, rural elderly in the hinterlands will have uh, you know, other requirements. Somebody uh, who is uh, in a slum area uh, in, in a city, you know, you know may, may need something else uh, as opposed to somebody who is from a higher middle class uh, who, may, who may say that loneliness is something that I need to look at. So we ourselves have found that within various segments of ours where we've done baselines need assessment, the need is so different. And that is where I think we as a corporate also find it a challenge. How do we do things on scale? And uh, this is going to be something that we will all need to look at and see how collectively we can address these things. For us as a corporate, I think, really having national footprints, having larger, larger programs, you know, now that we are established in, uh, in this space, having larger, larger footprint, thinking of larger designs, larger programs, and really reaching more number of people with collaboration, with convergence, working more closely with the government is something that we're really looking at. Vaccination awareness and facilitation is something that we want to do immediately, maybe roll it out in the next six to nine months. The national helpline is something that we're already involved in. Take the geriatric caregiver and the other skilling programs really to the next level, including training of health professionals. We don't need an MBBS doctor because his skills are very specialized. We don't need super specialists to look, for, look after elderly in the health space. 
we need people who are trained who can administer certain uh, certain health requirements of the elderly to them um shgs we also think that this model really helps why because it's the elder for elder concept financial empowerment unless one is financially empowered independent and that little bit of money coming into into that person's kitty on a day to day basis this financial you know gives a huge amount of confidence makes them makes makes that person feel wanted and more so in the case of elderly where they may have small requirements that they will be able to take care of so these are the things i think going forward we as a corporate definitely will be looking at in terms of scale in terms of convergence and in terms of national footprint and uh, yeah with this imtiaz i come to the end of my presentation and thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, over to you thank you thank you very much ma'am for your insights and uh, uh, sharing of experience and what you are doing currently i think the elder for elder concept and the empowerment is something which is again close to our heart and uh, we have had very good partnership with you continue to have and look forward to having many more uh, of those i think what uh, you said in on terms of uh, you know elderly issues being something which is you know many people are defining it in various ways but i think you just hit the nail on the head about when you said you know we have to address it because later is going to become such a burden you know you know to be very frank on the economy on the health infrastructure on the health services everything that we can think of i think that is something that we take from you as an insight and i think that's the way we should move forward to address it timely rather than wait for you know the so called explosion to happen later on so thank you very much ma'am thank you uh i have with uh, the pleasure of inviting mr j r gupta our next speaker uh, mr j r gupta is the uh, is the president and uh, national executive chairperson of the indian society of u3a university of the third age and he is also the chairperson of confederation of senior citizen association delhi um, gupta ji has been a very co close collaborator with helpage for very many years and we support and value his association with us he is a very vocal uh, advocate of the cause of the elderly and speaks on various issues advocacy with the government and ensuring lot of the policy changes and uh, uh, thinking change you know uh, and thinking to, uh, implementation changes happens uh, on the ground uh, for the cause of the elderly uh, gupta ji over to you uh, we would like to hear from you how do you see the senior citizens role in supporting yeah. empowering elderly during the pandemic over to you sir my voice is clear to you yes sir uh, thank you first of all i would like to thanks help us india to invite me on this national webinar on the occasion of world elders abuse of asthma day actually uh, we are celebrating this function at jantar mantar by holding calendar march since 2005 but unlucky due to covid we are unable mm. <clears throat> इसमें मैं थोड़ा सा आपको बताना चाहता हूं कि सीनियर सीजन हमारे कॉन्फेडरेशन में एक सीनियर सीजन संस्था हमने बनाई है और ये कॉन्फेडरेशन ने 2010 में हेल्पेज इंडिया के सहयोग से इसको हमने बनाया था और जब हमने बनाया था तब 15 के करीब थी उस टाइम लेकिन आज के दिन वो 142 हो गई है और इसमें बड़ा काफी बदलाव आया है और इसके अलावा हम लोग जो सीनियर सिटीजन एसोसिएशन के लिए जो काम करते हैं उनको एम्पावरमेंट करने के लिए उनको बड़ा बहुत बड़ा रोल है इसमें सोशल हिस्ट्री ऑफ सोशल जस्टिस एंड एम्पावरमेंट गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया का एन का सोशल वेलफेयर डिपार्टमेंट दिल्ली गवर्नमेंट का भी हमको बहुत सालों से सहयोग मिलता आ रहा है और इसमें हम लोग कोशिश करते हैं कि हमारे जो सीनियर सीजन है उनको कोई तकलीफ ना हो और उनके लिए हम जितना भी मदद कर सके खासकर कोविड में उन लोगों को बहुत परेशानी हुई है उन लोगों की जॉब भी चली गई है उनकी जो है जो उनकी मंथली इनकम थी वो भी कम हो गई है और इसमें मैं एक बात और ऐड करना चाहता हूँ 
कि हमने वैक्सीनेशन ड्राइव चलाया दिल्ली के अंदर और बल्कि ऑल ओवर इंडिया में भी चलाया और काफी लोगों को हमने लगभग 80 परसेंट तक के लोगों को हमने 80 परसेंट जो हमारे मेंबरशिप है उसका तकरीबन वैक्सीन हमारा इकतीस मई तक पूरा हो गया है और थोड़ा बहुत रह गया है तो ये जून के महीने में पूरा हो जाएगा इसके अलावा हम जो है जो परेशानी जो हम लोगों को हो रही है एक दो परेशानी भी मैं आपको आपके सामने रखना चाहता हूं हमारे हिसाब से ग्राउंड लेवल पे हिसाब से दिल्ली में 18 लाख सीनियर सिटीजन है और ऑल ओवर इंडिया 15 करोड़ है लेकिन हमारा और आपका डाटा नहीं मिलता है क्योंकि हमने तो ग्राउंड लेवल से कनेक्ट किया है और हमें नहीं पता कि 2050 में क्या होगा हम तो आज की बात कर रहे हैं आज दिल्ली में 18 लाख लोग हैं और उसमें इंडिया में पंद्रह करोड़ लोग हैं और इसके अंदर जो मेन चीज हमारे साथ जो हो रहा है एक तो देखिए वायस रस समान अवार्ड उतार साल वो कोविड में नहीं हो पाया वाका तो नहीं हो पाई एक अक्टूबर को होती थी और ऐसा सीनियर सीन फील कर रहे हैं और 2020 से वो अपने घरों के अंदर बंद पड़े हुए हैं और अब की बार तो कभी आज तक ऐसा नहीं हुआ कि पब्लिक पार्क भी बंद कर दिए गए आज के दिन कोविड में 2020 में जो फर्स्ट वेव आई थी उस टाइम सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट की गाइडलाइन में कहीं ये नहीं लिखा हुआ था कि पब्लिक पार्क बंद रहेंगे लेकिन अभी डीडी के जितने भी पार्क हैं इन्होंने सब में ताला लगा दिया अब आप ये देखिए कि डेढ़ साल से आदमी जो है अपने घर में बैठा हुआ है वो दवाई लेने नहीं जा सकता डिस्पेंसरी में नहीं जा सकता तो वो कहाँ जाएगा अगर आप उसकी सैर करने का भी तरीका बंद कर दिया इवन कुछ डॉक्टर्स थे जो हॉस्पिटल में काम करते थे सफदरगंज हॉस्पिटल में ऑल इंडिया शूट मेडिकल साइंसेज में वो लोग उन दिनों में 2020 में डियर पार्क हाउस खास में सैर करने जाते थे ये न्यूज तो आइटम भी आई थी तो ये समझ में नहीं आ रहा कि किसके ऑर्डर से ऐसा काम हुआ है मेरे डॉक्टर रश्मि जी सिंह जी अगर बैठी हुई है मेरी आवाज सुन रही है तो मैं उनसे अनुरोध करूंगा कि मैडम ये सीनियर सीजन तो बिल्कुल मर जाएंगे बिल्कुल अगर आप इनका शहर भी बंद करवा देंगे तो बहुत मुश्किल हो जाएगा आप जरा इनको चीफ मिनिस्टर साहब को कहिए केजरीवाल साहब को कि ये ऐसी चीज ना करें रोज तीन दिन से मीडिया में रिपोर्ट आ रही है सोशल मीडिया में आ रही है आज भी अखबार में आया हुआ कल भी आया था कि ये आपने पार्क क्यों बंद कर दिए क्यों बंद कर दिए पार्क तो सीनियर सीजन कहाँ जाएंगे बच्चे कहाँ जाएंगे लेडीज कहाँ जाएंगी बेचारे दो घंटे के लिए एक घंटे के लिए जाते थे वो भी आपने बंद कर दिया है दूसरी बात यह है कि उन लोगों को रिक्रिएशन ग्रांट भी जो है अभी जो है टाइम पे नहीं मिल रही है दो हजार उन्नीस से पेंडिंग है उनकी मैडम से मैं और कहना चाहता हूँ रश्मि सिंह जी से कि कुछ लोगों की पेंशन की प्रॉब्लम है और जो प्रॉब्लम आपके ऑफिस में नहीं है लेकिन जो आपके डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफिसर्स है ऑफिस ऑफिस है उसमें बहुत सारी प्रॉब्लम है एक एक डेढ़ डेढ़ साल से लोगों के उन्होंने एप्लीकेशन लेके रखी हुई है और आगे आपको हेड ऑफिस में नहीं भेज रहे तो कृपया उसको एक इंस्पेक्शन करवाइए मंत्री जी हमारे सोशल वेलफेयर मिनिस्टर है वो ओल्ड एज होम वगैरह में इंस्पेक्शन करने जाते हैं लेकिन कम से कम वो साइट ऑफिस में भी जाएं डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफिस सोशल वेलफेयर डिपार्टमेंट के और वहां देखें कि उनके पास कितनी एप्लीकेशन पेंडिंग पड़ी हुई है वो हेड ऑफिस को नहीं भेज रहे हैं तो क्या रीजन है ये डॉक्टर रश्मि सिंह से मैं रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि वो इसमें एक्शन लें दूसरी बात यह है डिप्टी चीफ मिनिस्टर हमारे सिसोदिया साहब फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर है कुछ दिन के लिए उनका सोशल वेलफेयर मिनिस्टर का चार्ज मिला था 2017 में एक डिसीजन हुआ था कि भी एफ के रेट बहुत कम हो गए सीनियर इनकी इनकम कम हो गई है और इनको दो परसेंट एक्स्ट्रा वो दिया जाए इंटरेस्ट दिया जाए कि हम बैंकों की मीटिंग करेंगे वो पेपर हमारे पास मिनट्स है हमारे पास लेकिन उसमें कोई एक्शन नहीं हुआ तो हम डॉक्टर रश्मि सिंह से भी अनुरोध करेंगे इसको फाइल को पुरानी दो की है वो मिनट्स निकलवाए जाए और उसमें कम से कम इंटरेस्ट हो रहा है ये तो बिल्कुल भूखे मरने वाली बात है इनको कोई साधन नहीं है तो इसलिए मैक्सिमम लोग जो है बहुत जॉब भी चलेगी उनके और इनकम भी कम होगी है इसके लिए आप हमारी हमारी कुछ मदद करें इसके अंदर और इसके अलावा अब क्या हो रहा है जो कोविड में हो रहा है क्या है कि जो बच्चे हैं डॉटर रिल्ला भी है वहां पर है सन भी है दादा भी है दादी भी है वो सब अपने अपने बिजी कर रहे हैं बच्चे जो है वो मोबाइल में लगे हुए हैं टीवी में लगे हुए हैं लेकिन जो दादा दादी है नाना नानी है उनको इग्नोर किया जा रहा है 
कोई उनकी वैल्यू नहीं कोई समझते हैं कोई उनको बात भी नहीं करते हैं और वो घर में पड़े पड़े उधर बाहर नहीं जा सकते सैर करने के लिए जा सकते और वो घर में पड़े हुए जो है उनको और परेशानी होती है तो मेन चीज हमारी ये कहने का है कि बेचारे जो सबसे ज्यादा मोस्ट सफर जो है आज के दिन कोविड नाइन्टीन में अगर मैं कहूँ तो सीनियर सीजन है सब लोग अपनी अपनी लाइफ जी रहे हैं लेकिन इनको लाइफ अपनी जीने का बिल्कुल कोई अधिकार नहीं है और इसमें एक और चीज है कि हमेशा हर साल एक अक्टूबर को 2015 में स्टार्ट किया था दिल्ली गवर्नमेंट ने कि हम जो है अवार्ड दे करेंगे सीनियर सिटीजन को जैसे मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ सोशल जस्टिस कर देती है वह स्वस्थ सम्मान अवार्ड इन्होंने दो में एक बार दे करके चुप लगा गए केजरीवाल साहब ने आने के बाद एक बार किया उन्होंने 2015 में तो उसके बाद क्यों नहीं स्टार्ट हुआ मैडम रश्मि सिंह से मेरा रिक्वेस्ट है कि कम से कम आप ये देखिए जो फाइल में एक बार आपने चला दिया 2015 में तो वो किसके ऑर्डर के कहने से बंद हुआ उसको भी थोड़ा निकलवाइए आप आज छह साल हो गए तो कम से कम थोड़ा सा ये लोगों को जो सीनियर सिटीजन काम कर रहे हैं उनके लिए कुछ को थोड़ा सा इंसेंटिव मिलता है अगर वो एक साल में एक फंक्शन हो जाए दो घंटे का एक घंटे का तो उसमें कोई फर्क पड़ता नहीं है और हमने तो यहाँ तक भी कहा था मैंने कहा अगर तुमको ऑडिटोरियम बुक करवाने की जरूरत नहीं है हमारे पास रिक्रेशन सेंटर है ग्रीन पार्क में बहुत बड़ा है 500 सौ में बना हुआ है आप हमारे यहाँ कर लो आपका सारा खर्चा बच जाएगा बल्कि जो खर्चा होगा हम उसको बियर कर लेंगे कम से फंक्शन तो करवाइए कम से साल में एक बार ये दूसरी बात है इसके अलावा हम ये कहना चाहते हैं कि जो टेम्पल्स है पिछली गाइडलाइन में टेम्पल्स खोल दिए गए थे और उनमें यह कहा गया था कि ना तो प्रसाद बांटेंगे आप और ना चरना मत देंगे पंडित अब की बार ये कर दिया है कि मंदिर तो खोल दिए हैं और कोई विजिटर राहुल नहीं करेगा देखिए आजकल क्या जनरल हमारी जो यंगर जनरेशन है वो मंदिर में नहीं जाती है लेकिन बूढ़े लोग सब पुराने संस्कार दिए उन लोगों ने वो मंदिर में जाते हैं पहले था कि भाई मंदिर के दर्शन भी कराते थे एक लोटा जल का भी चढ़ा आते थे शिवलिंग के ऊपर वो चीज से भी डिनाई हो गई तो हमारा मरना दोनों तरफ से हो गया है कि हम जब न मंदिर जा सकते हैं न हम पार्क में जा सकते हैं तो कहाँ जाएंगे 2020 से अब तक घर में बैठे हुए 2020 में तो ये ये सेकंड वेव से हुआ है जब से सेकंड वेव आई है तब से ये तोड़ा है तो ये चीजें हम ये चाहते हैं कि इसमें कुछ सुधार हो बाकी हमारी तरफ से प्रयास रहता है जिस किसको कोई प्रॉब्लम होती है किसी भी एरिया में प्रॉब्लम होती है जो दिल्ली में होती है जो बाहर होती है हम उनकी मदद करते हैं करते रहेंगे लेकिन सवाल ये कि गवर्नमेंट की भी कुछ हमारे को वो होना चाहिए कि जो हमारी जो है वो मदद करे क्योंकि सीनियर सिटीजन जो है आप ये समझ लीजिए कि 80 साल के 85 साल के आदमी जो है बहुत तो तंदुरुस्त हैं और वो जो है गाड़ी खुद ड्राइव कर लेते हैं अब ये ये गाइडलाइन में निकाल देते हैं कि पैंसठ साल और साठ साल के आदमी जो है कहीं कहीं आपके घर में रहिए बच जाइए तो वैसे तो ये सारे के सारे लोग जितने भी अब आई एम सेवेंटी एट ईयर्स अब आप मुझे कहिए घर पर रहो हम तो एक मिनट भी घर नहीं रह सकते हम कैसे रह सकते हैं बताइए हमारा तो टाइम ही नहीं पास होगा अभी हमारी रिक्रेशन सेंटर खुला हुआ है हम लोग तो यहाँ वहाँ काम कर रहे हैं कोई दिक्कत नहीं हमें तो फिजत रह भी चल गुप्ता जी म्यूट पे आप आपने म्यूट कर लिया उसको म्यूट कर लिया है सवाल ये कि थोड़ा गवर्नमेंट को भी कोऑपरेट हमको करना चाहिए तो मैं इन्हीं शब्दों में आपका सबका आभार व्यक्त करता हूं और मैं चाहता हूं कि आप इसका सीनियर सीजन को आप बिल्कुल बंद मत करें इनको थोड़ा खुला छोड़ें धन्यवाद थैंक यू गुप्ता जी सारे इश्यूज हाईलाइट करने के लिए नाउ यू कम टू द वेरी फैग एंड ऑफ द सेशन ऑफ दिस वेबिनारिक्वेस्ट अवर सी मिस्टर रोहित प्रसाद टू गिव द कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स Yeah, before uh, thank you, thank you, M J. I think we are run out of time. Now we have fifteen minutes behind schedule. Uh, but there were a couple of questions. I thought uh, you know since we have asked people to raise questions, so uh, if uh, Mr. Mishra is there, I'll just like to just put out two of them, which were comments or questions from our uh, you know attendees. Uh, Dr. Mishra, are you there? Can we uh, would you be able to respond? I think it is not that. So let, let's. Uh, uh, there was one question, and maybe uh, my colleagues uh, Loka and uh, Rema can respond. I think the question. Yeah, was, yeah, ah, not yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no problem, sir. Yeah, no problem, sir. 
So there was a one question which was there, which was around the fact that you know collaboration with business is good, but what about alignment with the government priorities? So I think this aspect about uh, you know elder care, there are many issues. Uh, government has set the larger overall framework, uh, but how do different stakeholders align to make a strong impact? I think that was one question. If you could give your take on it, that how how it should be taken forward. Mm -hmm. Is it typed? The question is typed here. Yes, it's actually there was one question on by Pragya Jain. So if you look on the uh, I think the ch uh, chat comment. So it says, will only collaborating with business help? It also depends on which areas government is fo focusing on. A stronger advocacy with the government apart from collaborating with business under CSR is also needed. So any any reaction, any comment to that particular point? See, one thing regarding the which areas we are focusing on. So uh, just a second. Uh, regarding like you know which areas we are focusing on so i have already given and you know uh, the areas i have described that those yeah. seven seven ec groups have been constituted in those to work on seven areas so, you know so uh, those are like uh, going to cover most of the um, issues if you want that i can again repeat one is like you know creating self help groups in urban and rural areas so that they can come together and um, you know ensure that how they grow together and uh, you know it's, it's going to give a voice to them sorry to uh, sorry to interrupt dr mishra i think the the question was around you know is there a way in which the businesses you know the csr and the government initiatives we have already outlined those how can they come together and align see uh, that's what i'm saying when we when we are talking about those areas one is for csr like you know we are going to see where it is required if the organizations come and say that these are the areas where they need some csr mm -hmm. then the government is going to go to the institutions with csr and request them to move you know will mobilize and channelize the csr in that direction as per the need so it's going to be more need based right. and second where they participate so the startup is a totally open area right now uh, startup is a totally open area so like you know they can just think over it. any ideas you know any innovative ideas which is going to like you know somehow um, contribute in the welfare of the senior citizens so organizations the startups can come and collaborate with the ministry and uh, like you know they can uh, partner with an equity share so so all, all these like you know uh, these these things are being um, thought about and uh, we have lot many open fields nothing is restricted nothing is limited so um, the um, you know businesses and other csr groups can explore thank you thank you dr mishra so uh, mr gupta i think you have outlined several areas for uh, dr mishra and dr singh also to uh, you know look at it. i'm sure uh, they will uh, they will uh, they have heard you. you yeah they have heard you um, I think the general point that I think all of us are making is that uh, the elderly, I mean, you all recognize that Corona has been a disruption for all, but for the elderly, particularly, this has been devastating in many ways. And Mr. Gupta was sharing, uh, you know, the experience on the ground. And it is evident that, you know, we cannot have one brush for the 60 plus. Uh, within the 60 plus, you have different segments you have a 80 plus who may be extremely as fit as a one of us you know and uh, and you may have a, a 60 year old who may be you know difficult you know may have, may have difficulty in moving may have mobility issues and so on so as a general perception or to have every 60 plus with a, a walker or a wheelchair is obviously the wrong way to look at it and therefore any policy or any programs has to take this segregation of elderly between the 60 to 70, 70 to, or what we call as the ability-based approach. So, you know, rather than an age-based approach, and that's something that as Helpage also we have advocated. So that's one very clear point of view. The second, I think, a very important takeaway was that 
I think the uh, government has outlined the larger framework and I must compliment them for taking some very new initiatives that has come forward. The elder helpline as a national elder helpline is, an, is one of the major initiatives that the government has taken and it's getting. We are fortunate or very happy to be part of it in some ways. Uh, the, the, the empowered group committees are also moving forward with action plans. So that has given us a sense of direction, a sense of purpose, a sense of urgency, and some of the resources are also getting aligned to it. So that's a very welcome approach by the government. Uh, we are very fortunate that even the corporate sector in some ways, and uh, both Rama and uh, Aloka were very candid in acknowledging that elder care has been seen from a charitable lens and not from a development lens. And I think it speaks volumes that, you know, some of the large corporates or even the corporates which have CSR funds are beginning to come forward and acknowledge that this is a space that needs to be invested in. A, you know, it's investment for now and an investment for the future. And that is something that is a welcome trend. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of it. As HelpAge, we go out and reach out to many corporates and we see some of the funding coming in thematic areas, but for elder uh, space, uh, you know, it's something that is a welcome uh, thing. Uh, I think the larger point around uh, partnership is something that is very dominant in this discussion. I think nobody can do it alone. Uh, the government puts the framework, wants to think things to scale, are coming up with new initiatives as an NGO, as a civil society player. We are trying to do our best. We reach out to 20 lakh uh, direct beneficiaries. But we have limitations. We have limitations in what we can do. So we all look for uh, partnerships. That's the uh, that's that's been a very important takeaway as well. Uh, I would just like to end with a, uh, a line which one minute. Yeah. one minute, one minute, Ji. only one minute. हाँ गुप्ता जी. मैं जाना चाहता हूँ. हमारे यहाँ forty senior citizens की death हुई है. लेकिन हमने उनको जो vaccine लगवाई थी, उनमें से कोई भी की death नहीं हुई है. और वो जो भी जो death हुई है कोई diabetes था या heart का था. लेकिन वैसे वैक्सीन लगाने के बाद कोई भी कैजुअलिटी नहीं हुई है तो ये मैं आपसे बताऊंगा थैंक यू गुप्ता जी आई बहुत ही पॉजिटिव आपने बात कही कि और मैंने आपसे शुरू में ही पूछा था एक बार दो एक दो महीने पहले कि वैक्सीन लोग लगवा रहे हैं तो आपने कहा हम तो सबसे आगे हैं सो आई थिंक यू आर ऑल्सो द रोल मॉडल फॉर हमने लगवा दिया था तीस अप्रैल तक जो लोग वैक्सीन से भाग रहे हैं या पूरी तरह समझ नहीं रहे उनके लिए आप एक मिसाल है सो आई थिंक दैट टू बी वेरी गुड So I, I think we have, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Shiv Kumar also very much highlighted the mental health issues. And as Aloka said, I think this is a long run. Uh, it's, a, it's something not going to happen immediately. Acute is more a disaster response, but the underlying pandemic or the silent pandemic is something that we have to deal with it. So I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different problems we have discussed. Uh, solutions as well. Uh, the only thing I'll say at the end is that there's a couple of lines I'm reading out. I don't remember it, but I, I liked it very much. Is that vikalp bahut hai bikharne ke liye, ek sankalp hi kafi hai savarne ke liye. So I think there are a lot of challenges and issues around us, but as long as we have a sankalp or a commitment uh, behind it, I think we'll be able to get through and make a difference. So with that, uh, I thank all the panelists and all the participants. Uh, we ran over time, so apologies for that. But thank you very much, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye.